Hey guys, Dylan from the Geek Duo here, and today I'll be bringing you my sort of predictions and character analyses and all that for Ruby Volume 7. Now, this should be going up on either Friday the 15th in Australia or in America, depending on how long it takes me to get this done whether things come up in the week that stop me from doing the editing I want to do and all that. But this will definitely be out before Ruby Volume 7 Episode 3 releases. Now, I, I'm not the best at articulating myself off the top of my head. So I have this um, spreadsheet, well not so much spreadsheet as notes. And I'm going to just be going through three main topics. They'll have mine and some my predictions for the um, volume and some of the predictions I've seen from other people, whether it be videos or just posts on social media. I'll be going through characters, what might happen to them in the um, volume and what is has happened I guess and the new characters I'll be talking about what they're based off of and then I'll be getting into the most controversial part of this video I'm putting it at the end so that people can just stop watching when I get to it if they don't want to but I shall be talking about the ships that will will or may be appearing in this season. Now, I'm not trying to start any Discord. I personally don't ship some of these. I personally do ship some of these. It's not going to be that clear which one is which. These are just ones that have been brought forward to me. Okay, let's start with the predictions. My first prediction, and this is pretty obvious is that Watts is going to be turning Mantle against Atlas. Now this does have a tiny, teensy bit of spoiler for episode 2 but Watts says that um, Mantle they didn't upgrade the security it runs on what the old knights and Paladins and all that ran on. So that means if he had access to them, he has access to mantle security and everything can turn. I'm assuming there's going to be some hidden mechanics and everything because this is technologically advanced that gives it a more dangerous aspect if it ever gets compromised. The next is well, the next three are going to be based off of the newspaper articles we saw in episode one. The first one was missing reporter found slain. Now, um, I'm just going to get his name up. His name is, um, Phoenix slash Knight. He um he did a good analysis on this. So if you want a more in depth analysis, go watch him. But he basically said, well, if the reporter was found slain, that means they have to be found, and they have to be slain means more than just murder means if they're found it is unlikely that it was a grim attack because the grim would have either taken the body or devoured the body slain makes it seem like someone either enjoyed it or went above what was necessary which makes me think Tyrion Tyrion 
would have likely been the most likely candidate to have slain this reporter. Which means that Tyrion and Watts have been in Mantle for at least a few more days than Team Ruby for the reporter to have been filed as missing and to have been found. Now, the second article says hole in the wall. This could be the wall that's around Mantle be to keep all the Grim out, much like we saw in, well, the natural wall of um, Vale. Now, this is obviously how the Sabres got in in um, episode one. They obviously went through the hole. hole. Now, this hole could have been formed one of two ways. The first way is it was how Watson Tyrion got into Atlas, well, Mantle, because they couldn't just rightly walk in because the borders were closed, and the fact that there were two um, stolen ships would have raised a lot of flags, so they likely snuck in, well, snuck in by blowing the hole in the wall. The second and this one is also a slight spoiler for episode 2, is that the hole was part of Ironwood's plan. Now, if you are you haven't seen it, skip ahead. I'll put a timestamp stamp below. But um, Ironwood said that he's planning to tell Atlas and Mantle about Salem. Tell them about the relics, tell them about the maidens, tell them about everything. Now, this will cause panic, as they've said not numerous times. This hole could be sort of a funnel. So all the Grim come charging in through there, and they're just more manageable than if they're just crashing, crashing, crashing many different wall holes. If they've got one straight line where all the grooms will be funneling in, it um, makes it a lot more manageable or could seem, but it also makes it more likely that they'll be over overrun by the sheer amount and that will um, release Grim into the city with less protectors than it had. The third one is the um, introduction, introduction to Robin Hill. It says, "Hometown hero versus Atlesian tycoon. Election imminent." So, there's going to be an election. This could be for actual election, like um, prime minister, president, whatever. Or it could be an election for the council. Now, the hometown hero is obviously Robin Hill. I'll get more into her later. The at least in tycoon, a tycoon meaning a very rich person, could either be Jacques, which is most likely, or Ironwood. If it's Jacques, that means she's going to be competing for his seat on the council. If it's Ironwood, she could be competing for one of his seats, or both. Either way, it, um, there's going to be an election. One of those two is likely going to be removed from their position of power if Robin Hill gets in. Now, this next one. In episode one, before we meet the drunk the two drunk people, we see graffiti on the wall saying, show your teeth with um, some, I'm guessing they're going to be like shark teeth or whatever, just comedic, sort of like Kirishima from My Hero Academia. But this could be, again, one of two things. It could be discrimination against faunas, being like, 
show your teeth to prove you're human because they either have an obvious feature or they have teeth or it could be a faunus uprising I think it's most likely this one the faunus uprising because the, as we see later not every faunus is discriminated against this is shown by um, the panda girl because she leaves Pietro's workshop with her new mechanical arm she doesn't seem to have been more hard done than the rest of Mantle she just seemed like a regular citizen and well also um Maro, who's a member of the Atlas Ace Ops, is a Faunus himself, so some Faunus I also forgot Neon, who is in um the Atlas at least in school. But I digress. I don't think it's a discrimination thing unless there's a specific hate groups which would be very very finical, finicky if they were to try and show that because they could either they could very easily stuff showing that up and get a lot of hate like if someone were to try and accurately show KKK but not have anyone like it which is impossible because there are people who support it and that is why it is rarely ever shown so if they were to show one for a similar thing for the faunus it would be very very hard to show very very hard to show in a way that won't cause massive backlash which is another reason I think it's going to be a um uprising group like a rebellion I forgot the word there I really should have compiled all the spoilers to the end of the um, prediction thing but this is one of three similar no wait this isn't the one of three there are three similar points I'm going to make in um the character thing but this one is a spoiler for episode 2 again I'll put the time link but Penny says when they're exploring the Atlesian school I'm sorry I can't remember the name of it but um she said this is going to be like Beacon all over again now that in and of itself is a very ominous statement because we all remember what happened the last time Penny was at Beacon the school fell three people died well three main characters died and yeah this could be very well alluding to the fall of Atlas now this was also alluded in Ironwood's plan because he said that once they shoot the Amity Arena up into space, um, they can afford to lose one more tower. Which makes me think that one more tower is going to fall. And it most likely will be Atlas. Now, this could either be the school falling, because the towers are for some reason located near the near or at the school. I don't understand why that. Probably because it's the most defended, like the argument with the relics. Or it's just they were there and then they built the school around it. I'm not sure. But it could be the fall of the school all over again. Or it could be the literal fall of Atlas. Because Atlas, as we know, a floating city up in the sky, meant to be a symbol of hope. If that were to fall, it would, it would crush all that hope 
that it is supposedly instilling in all the other provenances. And we know that it's held on by gravity dust. And the um, Atlasian mechanics. Sort of like the dust powered in um, Ironwood and Penny and Yang's arm and all that. And it's chained down. Which means it can float a lot higher. It has the risk of floating away. Now, if someone were to cut those chains, they could either cause Atlas to float off, which would be actually very funny just watching all the with the one percentage just float up into space, or that would cause it to fall down, which would a destroy Atlas, but it would also destroy the mines underneath, everyone in there would die, and the shock wave of it hitting the earth would likely um, destroy Mantle as well. Now there is a chance that both of those could be employed, like it gets, the chains are cut so it goes up, and then someone shuts down the anti-grav mechanics and all that, which would be a more devastating impact, and sort of guarantee that all of the surrounding area would be destroyed, because I don't know if it would have enough momentum to destroy all of Mantle in its current state. These next two have sort of opening, these relate to the opening. Now, in the opening, just after it shows the Aesops for the first time, it um, pulls back to a image of the five of them, and then it switches to Watts' mustache. As it's pulling back, in the top left hand corner you can see a sort of orbish shape that symbolizes the election result with three different colors I'm assuming meaning three different candidates fighting for the same and that's related to a what if this could very well imply that Watts will be rigging the election. Now, there are two reasons this might be done. One, because it could cause um, mayhem if Robin Hill gets in, because she'll be the only one we know from Mantle that's on the Atlesian Council, which in and of itself would create disharmony up in Atlas or he could be doing it so that um, Yuck wins. Now this relates to a um, theory I saw on Instagram I think it was that um, there are many many people who think that Jacques Snee will turn around at one point and start working for Salem, mainly because everyone sees him as a villain, so why not just make him that? But this person turns around and says, what if he always was? Like, this would be... this would be be um very very interesting to see that the father of one of the heroes is actually the villain and would be very miraculous ladybug-esque with sort of now this has been out for a while so I'm gonna say it. Adrian's father being the main bad guy in that Hawk Moth, I think it is. But anyway. Um, 
Yeah. I can't remember the exact reasoning as to why they thought that, but I thought I'd add it just to inform you of some people's opinion, well, ideas as to what may happen. And I can, I can understand them going that route. Because they damn well better not try and give him a redemption arc. He doesn't deserve it. Now, the final, the final prediction that I've actually compiled before this um, video is being recorded. I may find more after, but I won't be doing another video. But this final prediction is the formation of Team Orange. O R N J. I say it's orange as opposed to just reforming Juniper because when Juniper was formed, it was John, Nora, Pira, Ren. We didn't know initially that Ren, until the thing was formed, Ren was actually his second name. And, well, the reason it was put in as Ren instead of Lai is because it's the name he goes by. It's not because they just chose whichever name to um, fit into the color scheme. It's because it's the name he goes by. Now, this argument can be derailed by um, Cardinal. Because, um, Sky Lark. But, um, that, that is the exception. And, I, I'm just thinking of that right now. I didn't even click when I was writing this. But, um, I honestly think it's going to be, um, orange. Mainly because... Because Oscar will be the leader. Now, I like John as a leader. I didn't understand it initially, but now I now I fully understand. But I reckon because of his experience and all that, he'll be the sort of de facto leader of this unofficial group. Well, unofficial team. But, they may go Juniper, this could show some uncomfort amongst the fans, because they may see it, see it as erasure of Pyrrha, or they could actually show that in um, the show, with Jean being uncomfortable with the name, and, so, and maybe it starts as Juniper, but turns into Orange. And, well, I've been calling them Orange ever since, um, ever since Oscar joined the group, so that's part of why I put it in there. Okay, now I'm going to be talking about some, not all, of the major characters, well, major and mid-tier characters that are going to be showing up in this. These are the characters I put, um, I could think of something to discuss about, rather, and that's why some of them only have, like, one point, or some of them have, like, five, or some of them, some of the main characters have none. But, the first character I'm going to talk about is Crow. Now, unrelated to the actual character, but he, well, unrelated to in show, but he's got the new voice actor, Jason Liebrecht, who I don't know how to pronounce it, much like I didn't know how to pronounce Vic's last name, but if I didn't know beforehand that there was going to be a change in voice actor. 
I don't know if I would have been able to pick up on it, mainly because it's not so much the voice that's important to me, unless it's a massive change, because I didn't pick up with Mercury back um, season 2 to season 3, and I didn't also didn't pick up Ren when it went from Monty, God rest his soul, to Neef. I probably should have, but I didn't know who either of those were back when I was watching Volume 3. But, so the voice is fine. The characterization is good. And I put that down to he was written the same way, so he'll probably be mostly the same character. But anyway, um, two things... I have two points for Crow. The first one, in the opening, we see twice that he has a new outfit this season, which wasn't shown in any of the trailers or art or anything, but most notably is the removal of his jacket. Now, this is the jacket he's worn in every showing since he was introduced in Volume 3. And in the, it has an inside pocket where he keeps his hip flask. He doesn't keep it on his hip, so it's not a hip flask, it's just a flask anyway. That's just pedantics, but this, this is notable because the part of his arc in Volume 6 was getting over some sort of his drinking. Which is why I think the reason his um, jacket is gone is a choice by him to remove the temptation. Because even if he doesn't carry his flask around with him, he's still going to be reaching into that pocket for it as a sort of habit. If he doesn't have the jacket with the pocket, there's less of a temptation. He may still get the ghost urge where he'll reach and be like, I'm not even wearing the jacket, but it removes less of the temptation. The second, and this one was hinted at, I think, by Kerry. And there was a fan, a fan asked if um, Crow's bad luck was caused by by his mindset and drinking and all that whereas because he's got a it's sort of like a placebo where he's got a bad mindset so he can see only see the bad luck he brings and all that or maybe his bad mindset does only cause um bad luck most notably the worst things happen when he's drunk they asked, if he were to stop drinking and get a better mindset, would his semblance change? Now, the, I think it was Kerry said, that's a good point, or something along those lines. Now, I think that this fan has sort of scratched the surface on it, whereas the mindset does affect it. I don't think it's so much it affects the um, act, it affects the luck it brings. I still reckon it'll only bring bad luck. I reckon the mindset in that is stopping him from controlling it. Now, I, I reckon he's going to because of the stop drinking and hopefully better mindset and all that, he's going to be able to learn or notice that it seems to happen a lot less random now than it did. So hopefully by the end of the whole thing and all that, he'll have full control much like the others do. I reckon that would be a great character arc, 
because it mirrors his um sort of battle with alcoholism and all that, gaining more control of his life, control of his semblance. Just I like those kinds of tropes in shows and that. The next character is Winter. Now Winter has always been an interesting character because we just don't know much about her. Yes, yeah, she's Weiss's sister and she keeps up this um, professional appearance unless she's just with Weiss. But other than that, there's not much we know. We know she's a special operative. We suspected and now know that she knows about um the maidens and relics even we suspected that even back in volume 3 or well, I know I did but the only thing that I've seen people discussing about with winter so far in relation to this new season is the possibility of her becoming the winter maiden now it makes sense because of her name, Winter, Winter Maiden, they'd go hand in hand. Or they could be throwing another red herring in like what they did with Vernal. Vernal, which translates to spring, was thought to be the winter, the spring maiden, but wasn't. Now, if they do that again, I, I... And a few others reckon the most fun, the most funny thing that could be in relation to becoming the new maiden would be Yang. Now, I I like this because a it shows one of the main, the originally main four becoming a maid, which we all thought all four of, well, I say all, I've got to stop saying that, a lot of people thought all four of them would be come maiden, Weiss Winter, um, Ruby Spring, Yang Summer, Blake Autumn, well, fall. Alternatively, you could switch Blake and Ruby around, but people always thought that Yang would be summer and Weiss would be winter. What if Yang becomes the winter maiden? A, that is ironic because of her hot-headed bright colours and all that, her fiery aspect and all that, being with winter, but also, what if Yang has to be taught how to deal with her new powers and ability by her mother. This gives a reason for Raven to come back into the show. For more than just necessity. Because I say necessity because she's the only one of the heroes that knows that Watts is working with Salem. The only other people who would know of Watts are Pietro, Ironwood, maybe Winter and the Aesops, but yeah, and they'd only really know of him as a disgraced scientist and doctor. They wouldn't know he's working with Salem, so Raven would have to come back for that. The second point I have for Yang, because we moved on to her, is that she'll obviously be getting a new arm upgrade. We saw in the opening that her arm no longer has the scratch on it, though that could just be because it's hidden by the jacket, but it's fairly certain that she'll be getting a new arm. What I want to see is it actually do what it does in the opening, in 
it shoots a fireball when she activates her semblance because this would a look really cool and b give an extra a aspect to an arm that could be better considering it's at Lysian technology but I mean it's also got the auto release but that doesn't really serve much other than escape escaping like she did in volume 5 or for fun like it doesn't really serve an attack purpose and it's got the gun yes but other than that if it had some extra dust capabilities as well that would be much much better now I'm going to skip over this next one because it um it's a spoiler also I reckon that um Yang's new arm how funny would it be if um well not so much funny but interesting if what's hacks it now I um I saw a little comic of this being made not long after I wrote it on here, so I know I'm not the only one who thinks it. I don't think I saved it though. Um, let's give me a quick look. Um, ah, here it is. They, um, this person on, I'm assuming it's Twitter, says, um, that, um, if Watts can access Yang's arm, how, he could probably use it as a sort of Trojan horse or sort of sleeper agent in which if he ever needs to, if he's ever cornered by Yang and the team, he'd be able to either detach it and have it work on its own, or just whip itself around and start shooting at everyone, in which case they'd be distracted and have to deal with that, giving him a chance to escape. Okay, now that we're done with Yang, and we're leaving Ironwood till the end, Next, we'll be going with Oscar Osbin. Now, I I am a firm believer that Osbin will return this season. This is mainly because he'll want to speak with James. He'll either tell James everything about Salem or he'll pipe up to um, tell to have a go at James because of what we learn in episode 2. But I believe the first one to be the most likely. And this also sort of... This was has been around since, well, Volume 1, but was made stronger in, um, Volume 4, I think it was, no, Volume, yeah, Volume 5, when we learned about the reincarnation and everything, and, um, Volume 6, but I reckon it will be revealed that, um, well, Oz was, we know pretty much that Oz was the King of Remnant, but I reckon it'll be revealed that that King was related to Jean. Either it was his great-grandfather, I think it was, who originally had the sword, which just so happens to be one of the relics, 
well, there was a sword that was a relic. There was also the, um, what's it called, the circlet, which we also saw the king wearing. Well, more of a crown, but still. But anyway, John says his um sword was a fairly a family heirloom, and so if if John's great grandfather was the king of Remnant or was related to the king of Remnant, this would be a really funny piece of lore because of how much John doesn't like Ospin. The, we thought his great-grandfather was the king back in Volume 1. We thought that we found out Oz was basically the king of Remnant in Volume 5. And then there was the massive hate for Ospin in Volume 6. We could bring that full circle in Volume 7 if we find out that Oz was actually related to John. I also think it would have been funny if Ozpin had a reincarnated into John, but that's a different story. Now, we, um, I put Whitley here because I see him going one of two ways this season. There's either going to be a redemption arc, which he hasn't done anything majorly bad other than being a piece of shit, but yeah, or he's going to turn out like his father. This will be found out this season. I'm sort of hoping for the first one, only so Jacques has no one. Just everyone who once idolized him is now gone. If that can be paired with him also losing his company or status, that would be a fitting end to his tyranny. And might also be what pushes him to Salem, but I digress. Now, um, we've. I'm now moving on to Raven. I've already said two of these fa these um points. One is that she'll return to tell people that what's is Salem, and she may train the new Winter Maiden, but. She, you know what, just assume that any point in the next, well, for the rest of this video, could be spoilers, because basically, um, the, after the next one, it basically is, but, um, yeah, I reckon that she may be sent by Ironwood to help ready the other hun the huntsmen of the other kingdoms for his incoming announcement about what Salem real what the true battle really is, what what's coming, what's out there, everything, maidens, relics. If I reckon that she and Ty will have to team up with the hero but be sent on a different assignment one to sort of rally the huntsmen get them ready for the influx of grim attacks that they are going to face and also help quell some of the turmoil that's going to come out of the announcement which would a be a redemption arc and b could result in all of those huntsmen 
joining the final fight against Salem, which I reckon would be really cool and sort of Avengers Endgame-esque. Now, this will be the final one that's not so much a spoiler, but um, this is Penny 2.0. I'm going to keep calling her that because, or maybe it was Penny 3.0. She looks basically like a fan's design when they were doing the 2.0 and 3.0 of many characters. So I can't remember which one it was, but um, I've seen a lot of people up in arms about the fact that she no longer uses her swords. A, this is, we've only seen her fight in the first episode, meaning she may still use her sword, she just didn't think it was necessary in that fight. Or B, and this one's more likely, she's not ever going to use them again because she has no strings on her. She's based, Penny is based off Pinocchio. This we've known since the beginning, but in some forms of the show, Pinocchio dies. Well, I say show. Pinocchio dies and is brought back to life as a real boy. Now, Penny's not ever going to be so much human, but she did die and she's been brought back better than before, meaning like Pinocchio, she may have been brought back with no strings. This could also be because the strings sort of tore her to pieces, but I reckon it's sort of a symbolization of that she's real, she's real now. And also, much like Yang's arm, what if she's had? She could either get hacked during the show, or her core may have been tampered with even way back in Volume 3, because they got access to Penny in when they got access to Ironwood's scroll. So she may very well be be a sleeper agent. And if that happens, some seriously bad shit could go down because of how powerful she actually is. Anyway, now I'm going to go back to Ironwood, and this is where all the rest is basically spoilers. Um. I'm just going to lead off of that penny quote with what if Ironwood gets hacked. Basically, I'm saying if anyone has some mechanical aspect to them, what may hack them. And that's just... Because he very well may. We never know. He may not. He may not be able to because of the biological aspects mixed with the cybernetic. Or he may be able to. But anyway, I reckon that out of everyone, Ironwood is the most likely to get hacked because he is a cyborg. Well, I say cyborg, he's half robotic. I reckon this will be sort of um, a more physical representation of a inner turmoil, like his, the one he currently has, which is to protect the people or to prepare the people. He can protect the people by um, not telling them about Salem, or he could prepare them for the incoming fight that's going to happen, whether he says or not. Now, if we also have him having to literally fight himself. 
that would be another great mirror mirroring thing which I said I'm very fond of in shows I also reckon if that were to happen he may lose his other arm or other leg in which case or both in which case he may have won the fight but he'll be less human because of it which is also sort of ties into the comment he made like yes they all hate me but I'm willing to pay that price for the betterment well, to prepare them for what's coming I'm willing to sacrifice what's left of my body to protect everyone. And the second point I have is I don't it's not that I don't trust Ironwood it's just I don't believe he is doing the best thing. This could be two reasons. One, he doesn't fully trust them. Like, he only trusts himself. He's willing to work and give them some trust, but like Osbin, he likes to keep it close to him so that if something goes wrong, he can only blame himself, which I understand. And this sort of stems from the fact that he lied to the heroes when they came into his office he said if he'd known it was them they wouldn't have been arrested in the way they were however later on he points out when he's saying he's going to help them upgrade their weapons and everything he says can't have you working like this and then pulls up an image of Blake fighting in Atlas when she pulls out her broken sword which means he has to have seen that video at least once to be able to reference that exact image and considering they were arrested pretty much straight after that fight and then brought straight to him he knew it was them before they were untied because of winter which means he outright, he outright lied now the second point I want to make is what if there's someone whispering in his ear someone he trusts that is not giving him the best advice now I have two candidates for this and these are two of the new characters we have but if something like that's happening and that person is working for Salem but they're informing Ironwood helping him make his decisions and everything then he may not actually be doing what's best for people but he thinks he is and this leads into the he won but he's less human because of it he's doing what he thinks is he's been told is right but it's not someone who wants the right thing telling him it's right Um, now we have the Winter Maiden, who people still very much believe is Willow Schnee, and this is, this, they believe this has been reinforced by the fact of the poor state that, um, w the Winter Maiden was said to have been in, like, she's stable, but she's older and frail. Compare that to the age that Weiss's mum would be.
be, I'd say, easily 40s, like, early to, like, in the 40s to 50s range, which would be considered old for a maiden when comparing her to, like, Autumn, but would be on par with about what Raven is. Maybe a little older, maybe a little younger, we don't know for sure. But we also know that she's physically in bad shape because of the excessive drinking she does. Because that, we know it was a glass of wine here, a glass of wine there. Now it's a bottle of wine here, a bottle of wine there. And she out basically all day drinking in the garden, which... It's a hell of a lot more than Crow ever did. So that would bring a toll on them. Compare and the winter made it to bad shape, so but people also reckon that the winter maiden's going to die. And if the winter maiden is Willow Schnee, that means that Jock gets full control over everything related to that family name. Which is why I said if Whitley turns gets a redemption arc, then Jacques may lose everything. He may for the briefest amount of time gain absolute power and control over the company, only to have that ripped away from him as well. And that is another reason I'd be okay with it being the obvious option of it being Willow. Because I very much like terrible people being given what they want. Only to have it nearly instantly ripped away with everything else of substance in their life. Because it's fitting. But yeah. They also believe that the um, future Winter Maiden will open the vault, which sort of makes sense. And also, I very much want to see what the, st the staff of creation can do, because, well, it was explained to me that it was the staff of creation. I wasn't sure back in um, Volume 1, not Volume 1, Episode 1, if it was or not. Now. now we've got this two background characters. I'm only going to um, say these very quickly. We've got Drunk Guy 2. He was actually given a proper title but I didn't read it. This is the guy that falls over in episode 1 after trying to chase after the heroes. And I put him on here because he seemed to have something important to tell Weiss. Once he realized who it was, he's like, Hey, uh, wait, you you are... and then falls, and falls over. The next one is the guy on the aircraft who tells the heroes about um, Robin Hill and her Band of Happy Huntsmen. Now, I'm fairly certain we all know who Robin Hill is. She's Robin Hood, Happy Huntsmen, um, the Merry Men. I forgot the title, but I reckon he'll be sort of the bridge between Robin and the heroes. Like, he'll be why they initially interact and yeah so he'll be back to sort of bring his statement together now we've got the um sort of i'm going to say seven people who have been introduced in this volume. We've got 
the five Aesops, who are all based off of Aesop's fables, and while I'm not familiar with the majority of them, I do know some of these, but yeah. The first one, the leader, Clover Ebby, Ebby, I don't know how to pronounce it, um, but he is based off of one of two um, stories. He's either based off of A Fisherman's Good Luck, which in basically the fisherman was, um, he was having a string of bad luck and everything, considering giving up on everything in his life, and then all of a sudden, the fish started biting, everything started going his way, and yeah, that's like a very brief and quick but terrible explanation of the story, I'm sorry. Or, he could be based off of the fisherman and the flute. The fisherman had a flute that he was sort of like trying to be the Pied Piper, where he was trying to make some form of animal dance with the flute. When the animal disobeyed and wouldn't dance, he caged the animal and then the animal started to dance trying to get free. And he's just like, you would not dance when I wanted to, you won't get anything for doing it now. Which is a sort of, which is a, he either good, like really lucky, or he's malicious and that, which is also why I put him as one of the two people who could be betraying Ironwood if someone's whispering in his ear, because if he's based off of the second one, he's not really a good person, but yeah. He's got a, um, luck motif with, um, the horseshoe, his clover badge, his, the rabbit's foot on his belt, and his first name. And he's got a fisherman motif with his fishing rod weapon and his last name, which is why it seems more likely that he's a fisherman's good luck. Or, this could be a red herring, and they make it think, oh yeah, he's based off of this one, but no, he's based off of this one, and he's going to betray them. But anyway, um, his last name, Ebi, or Ebi, is Japanese for shrimp, which relates to, um, the fisherman aspect. At least, this is what I've been told by someone who can speak Japanese. Or, it's short for Ebisu, which is the Japanese god of luck and fishermen. Which sort of relates to both of his motifs. And it's because of this that people think he's got a good luck semblance. So like, the opposite of Crow, where instead of creating bad luck for those around him, he creates good luck for himself. Anyway, the next one is Harriet Hare Bree. Now, I put hair in there because that is what the other Aesops call her as a nickname because of Harry. She is based off of the tortoise and the hare, so she's obviously the hare from that. Very competitive, um, cocky, and most likely going to lose something because of her cockiness. Much like how the hare challenged the tortoise to the race, was so ahead, could easily have won, but was just like, oh yeah, there's no way this, tur this tortoise is ever going to catch me. I'm going to take a nap. And then they lost. This could be alluding to something later in the volume with Harriet. 
all of these all of these Aesops have something bad that could happen because of or to them. Clover turning out to be a bad guy. Harriet losing because of her cockiness. Um, and I'll get to the others when I actually go through them. But Harriet also because she's a hair could have a like a jump semblance like high higher jump longer jump I don't know something rabbit like with her semblance without being a faunus like velvet next we have Elm Edern I think it's who is based off of the elm and the vine the um this is a sort of co not co symbiosis story in which the elm supports the vine for its companionship the vine grows on uses the elm to grow so they need each other which is why people think she's going to be like the backbone of the team she's the tree the vine grows on and so which is also why she's solid I'm going to say because she's not she's not big she's because most of that looks like muscle she's going to she has to be strong because of the massive hammer she wields which is why people think she may be related to Nora just because of the hammer but we know she uses a hammer because of Ren and people also think because of the story they're based off of he, she's going to be married or related to Vine which is the um I'm going to say albino guy, though that may be offensive to some people, so if it is, I'm sorry. But, yeah, he's the albino Aesop. And her semblance is likely going to involve something with her feet. As we see in the, briefly in episode one, more clearly in the opening and clearly in episode two her shoes do not cover her heel or her toes or the balls of her feet there's just a strap about yay thick running along the bottom of both her feet to sort of hold the shoe on now i reckon this could be one of two things it could be a sort of sort of like how spider-man can walk up walls with the they say it's because he can attract atoms and all that to sort of like that and this I sort of put together because she's shown running up the arm of the petrogigas which is the ice creature I've been informed it's not a geist unless it's out of the form if it's in its um golem form it's a petrogigas I still like calling it a geist but yeah she's shown running up the arm and that's not exactly a flat or very easy surface to run up a it's ice and B the angle that parts of it is on or she could have sort of a seismic sense like Tough Beifong or a lot of earthbenders in the legend of Korra and that is why she has her shoes open because I don't think you'd really other than it being a necessity I don't think you'd really have your feet open in a tundra because that's a good way to get frostbite and then there go your toes. The next Aesop 
well, Elm, the bad thing that could happen with Elm is, well, the team, something bad happening to the rest of her team, because, like the Elm in the story, if that, if something happens to that vine, then there goes its symbi symbiotic relationship. Is symbiotic the one where they both benefit, or... I don't know. If I'm wrong, please correct me, because I know there are, there are like three different bio symbiotic... There are two others that are like it, but there's parasitic, symbiotic, and there's a third one. I don't remember what the third one is, but I think that may be the actual one I'm looking for. And anyway, yeah, that relationship is what builds her character, then it something happening to it would be detrimental to her. The next one is Vine Zeki. I'm just going to say I pronounced that right. Who again could either be the vine from the elm and the vine or he could be the goat and the vine in which case a goat comes along and well comes across the vine it eats all the leaves off of the vine thinking it's killed it the vine turns around and says Jokes on you, I'll still have enough nutrition and everything to grow the grapes and the those grapes will grow on to be the wine that you are sacrificed with or whatever. Something like that. And that sort of sacrificial and all that is people think I've got the actual reasoning here, but it takes me a few minutes, not a few minutes, but a few seconds of looking down to actually find the right one, so, um, there. Vine, there it is. When, when a goat starts eating a vine's leaves and shoots, the vine retorts that it will still have enough juice left to produce grapes. The wine from which will be poured over it when the goat is sacrificed. The moral of this fable is, ingratitude prevents all the measures of religion in society by making it dangerous to be charitable and good-natured. I don't understand how that can be gotten from the extract they put with this, but they say they've chosen that this is most likely because of the monk-like attitude and look, and because of Vine's last name, Zeki Ziki, is the Turkish name for boys, which means God remembers. I can't speak Turkish. I never heard it spoken before, and I'd have no hope of learning it. But, yeah. And that's also why they sort of linked him to this because of the monk like aspect. And I just put in he may potentially be a robot. Still like the um one from Genlock who was working at the anvil up the top. Yeah. And might be hacked like every other mechanical thing on this list. Next we have Marrow Amin. He is based off of well, he's a dog faunus. And People think he's based he's based off of the dog and its reflection. A dog is walking 
with a stolen piece of meat in its mouth. It comes across a puddle and looks down, seeing its reflection. Seeing that the... Thinking the reflection is another dog that appears to have something better, he drops the meat he's carrying in an attempt to get what he thinks is something better. Now, this could very, very well be alluding to Marrow giving up what he has, his position as a Aesop's, for something that seems better, an offer from Salem, but isn't. Which is why he is the second candidate for someone who may be a double agent whispering in Ironwood's ear. I reckon he's most likely because of the dog and its reflection is the only um, story that people have said he could be based off of. Whereas Clover has two and one of them is good. So, I say Marrow is the one most likely out of any of them to be the traitor. And, yeah, he's going to regret, he's going to realise that he's not as good as he thought he was when he, once he accepts the offer. But it'll be too late then. What he had is already ruined. Next we have Robin Hill, who, as I said, is based off of Robin Hood. Now, she, she will be sort of in the sense of stealing from the rich to give to the poor. I think that's merely a metaphor in which she'll be stealing the spot on the council from Jacques, who represents the rich, to better off Mantle, who are very much the poor. So, stealing from the rich, giving to the poor. However, there is another um, theory that I've seen. This is, again, from Phoenix Knight. In Robin Hood was often depicted as a bandit. Who do we know is a bandit, or was? Crow, from the Bronwyn tribe. They're the only bandits we know of. And so, him and many others think that Robin has a past with either Crow or the entirety, well, Crow and Raven, or the entirety of Team Stark. And this could, this is also built off of how well Crow and Robin fight together in the opening. Though that could just be a fight that never actually happens, like a lot of the opening ones. But if it does, then it is likely that because they are able to fight so well together, then they may have fought together in the past. And it could also be that... um. She'll have a sort of Maid Marion-esque character who I reckon will be a part of the Atlesian Council, much like to Maid, the Maid Marion to Robin was the princess to the thief, this Maid Marion as character will be the high standing citizen to the poor representative. I also think that this Maid Marion will be a Mr. Marion, 
because Robin Hill, Robin Hood, the, I think it was actually Happy Hunts Women, as opposed to the Merry Men, though that could be just my brain playing tricks on me. I did, I really should have rewatched the start of episode 2 before, um, doing this, but hindsight's a bitch. But, yeah, so Maid Marion to a Mr. Marion, or whatever they're going to call And, well, yeah. Now, everything are about the happy huntsmen, huntswomen, whatever it is, I've already said, so I'm not going to get any more into that. And now. Now we're getting into ships. Now, if you don't want to hear any of this or you're going to start any comments, hate comments, whatever, stop watching now. I don't want to have to deal with this because if you just do it, I'm not going to respond. Your thing is, your comments are likely going to be banned anyway, so there's absolutely no point in any Discord. But, I have been informed by three or four people on different social medias that there was at one point where it was said some ships will be explored this vault. Now, some meaning more than two, so at least three. The most obvious two are Bumblebee, which there's obviously because of how Volume 6 ended, they're basically a couple, but not quite sort of ambiguous. And um, Aaron Zach said in a live stream, when asked about Blake's hair, she said, Cora cut her hair in reference to Legend of Korra, and we all know how Korra ended, specifically Korra being revealed as bisexual and getting together with Asami, which you see more in the comics because they couldn't actually put it in the show, but there is numerous um, kiss scenes and all that in the comics. I'm blanking on the title, but it's the one where that's set after book four, obviously, but yeah. So we're likely going to get more Bumblebee, possibly a kiss or just admitting that they're a relationship. I don't know how far they're going to go. Um, the next one that's obvious is Renora. Because of Volume 4, how that ended. Nothing was said about it, Volume 5 or Volume 6. Like, we know Nora's liked Ren since the beginning. We know Ren sort of... I'm not going to say ex showed he had feelings for her as well, but sort of... Again, left very ambiguous, but I reckon that's going to be the second ship that they're going to show. That leaves at least one more, and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight ships that it may be. Now, the first one is White Rose. White Rose, I said, look, I personally never shipped White Rose. I know I said at the start that I'm not going to say whether I shipped it or not, but, um, I, back when Penny was introduced, I instantly was, um, nuts and dolls, and, um, 
then when volume 3 started I got on the ship of Snowbird and even though I no longer really believe it but at that time I believed the um, crow was Ruby's father theory and all that it just sort of stopped me for once Penny was out of the equation sort of putting Weiss and Ruby together and still having Crow and Winter and it just I just never really got on board even after I was out of that mindset but the they are best friends they do care deeply for each other Weiss has shown that she cares more about Ruby in a Sundere very much with the affection that calling her an idiot which is basically what Dolt means which is very it's not like I like you Baka or whatever I can't speak Japanese very well and also Weiss's character arc through the whole show would any other show very much mean that the person she is closest with is going to be her love interest. Or it could be Jean, because he showed interest in her, but I highly doubt they're going to go there after the whole um, Arcos White Knight love triangle thing that they made fun of in Ruby Chibi, but I doubt they'd go there. But yet, yeah. so White Rose does have potential. Plus, there's very, very little doubt that Juxney would not be homophobic, so it would also be a massive fuck you to him, which I would like. But, like I said, I never got on board with it. I wouldn't be upset if it happened, but also I wouldn't be ecstatic if it happened. The next one we have is Nuts and Dolls, which I said I ship. Now this one, like White Rose, Ruby was both of their first friends. Um, she was shown She's shown mourning, I actually think technically she's shown mourning twice more because when she got impaled, but that was because her silver eyes activated and they couldn't have activated when Penny died because there was no Grim around, but I reckon if they would have if that was possible. And it also would have been more intense because, well, A, Penny died and then was brought back, whereas Weiss was still alive after being impaled. And, yeah, but, um, Penny's, Penny is technically a living weapon. And from the very beginning to now, we're still shown of Ruby's intense love for weapons, whether it be her own or anyone else's. And considering a walking weapon and a girl who loves weapons sort of makes sense. And also they could very much go a way that would piss off a lot a lot of people because um lgbtq they get they do get a lot of representation in this show i say they I, like i'm not a part of it but anyway and but ace people don't get representation in anything and they have chosen that they want ruby which yeah, I can understand, but 
I'm getting to the part that would piss people off is technically Penny isn't a person, so she doesn't have a gender. So technically, no wait, that's not what I mean. She's not technically. Yeah, she's not a person, technically. So, Ruby wouldn't have feelings for a person in that sense. So, if they wanted to piss people off, they could say, here's your representation. An ace person in a, re in a loving relationship. What? Well, I say ace, I mean a romantic person in a romantic relationship that they initiated. They would piss people off. Which is part of the reason why I don't think it'll happen. I reckon White Rose has more of a chance than Nuts and Dolts. Yeah. Next we have um, Mechanical Bird, which is Iron Wooden Crow. Um, this was picked up again massively after because of the concern that Crow shows when he sees how bad Ironwood got has gotten in the first one in the first episode he's just like James what have you been doing or what happened to you and of course their hug in chapter 2 which other people have suspected might have been James bugging Crow, but let's just put it as a touching friends, Ironwood needed a hug. I highly doubt this would happen, because while Rooster Teeth does like doing representation, they haven't shown, well they have shown it, but it was only in a single still image of two guys together as opposed to the numerous accounts of two girls together which is a lot of people are unhappy with like if you're gonna show representation show a variety of representation not the same thing over different like different I'm just gonna say letters but yeah um, next we have Snowbird, which is Winter and Crow, based off of the implied sexual tension that a lot of people had thought they had in Volume 3, like the, if you've watched Buffy, sort of Xander Cordelia, the arguing, and then, yeah, like they argue, and they fuck, and they argue, and they fuck. Now we've got a new ship that's come just because of this season, and it's called Snowbird, with a Y, because it's got Robin, and her name is spelt with a Y, and this is because people want Winter to be a lesbian, and they will pair her with any adult female, or Yang. Since we haven't seen Winter, we not Winter, we haven't seen Robin, we have no grounds for this ship to be true or not. We have no idea if they'll even ever interact. And now, okay, next one is, again, Birds of a Feather. A ship that's just come in this season. Well... Technically, no, because it used to relate to, um, Crow and Raven, but I'm changing the meaning to mean Crow and Robin, and based off of, it's based off of their uh, assumed shared past, because people think she was part of the Bronwyn tribe. Now we've got, um, Birds of a Feather with a Y, because I just which is Raven and Robin. I put this one with the Y because the Snowbird with a Y was the lesbian pairing, so 
this one being a lesbian pairing I just kept the Y motif but um this is also based off of the assumed shared past and people want Raven to be a lesbian and they'll pair her with any adult female. And finally something I'm very surprised to have seen get a lot more popularity is Night Garden, which is John and Oscar. They are the seventh and eighth wheel, respectively, according to um, White Rose shippers, because the first two wheels would be Yang and Blake, then you've got Ren and Nora, then you've got um, Weiss and Ruby, so you've got Yon and Oscar. I actually should have put Weiss and Ruby as 3 and 4, but whatever, I digress. And like I said, this is this has the same reason as Mechanical Bird, which is people want a gay couple that is more than just a background couple in a still image, or the widely believed sexual tension um, not sexual tension, gay undertones of Team Sun, specifically Sun and Neptune. Yeah. Out of, out of all of these, the Sun ships that I reckon is going to be Bumblebee, which is obvious, Renora, and it would have to either be White Rose or Snowbird, because White Rose has had the um most build up out of every single one of these others and yeah there's the um the um fighting to fucking relationships are very popular even nowadays so I reckon that would be the only reason as to why it, but they wouldn't be fucking because this is still technically a teen show, I guess, so fighting to love is, would be the more easier way to say it, but yeah, I reckon the Bumblebee, Renor, and White Rose will be the ships that are explored. Maybe one of them won't work out. Maybe they all will. We'll see. As long as they're done good, I don't care. Because I just watch it for... I actually watch it for the story. Much like most other shows. Anyway, this was a terribly spoken video. I went on way too many tangents, I forgot words, I rambled, but I got everything I wanted to out, and this is going to be hopefully edited in when I go like that and like that, I'll have different, the different options above my hands, I'll have images drawn from the show to actually show, to actually show what I'm talking about when I'm referring to a specific image, but if things come up during the week and I run out of time, you've still got the audio, so I'll catch you in the next one.